Welcome to Crypto Trader, the world's first televised cryptocurrency investment show. We've had a record week on the market, so we've got a cracker show in store for you today. We've got guests in the studio, guests in Silicon Valley, guests in Hawaii. We've got news, we've got information, we're going to learn how to buy and sell Bitcoin, and some lucky viewer is going to walk away with some of their very own Bitcoins. So there's so much to see, so much to do. Let's not waste time and go straight into the market indicators. A Bitcoin will cost you 3,370 US dollars. If you remember when we spoke about Bitcoin last week, it was trading at $2,700. That's one hell of a return in a week. If you look at the Bitcoin Cash Coin, the one that came off the Bitcoin chain, it's trading at $298. Not such a great week. It started the week at $670, reached a high of about $1,700, and now we're back at under $300. Our other currency, the Ethereum currency, trading at just under $300, $297.78 US dollars. Ripple, the other currency, trading at 18 US cents. It hasn't had such a great week. It hasn't followed the rally in all the other currencies. The total market cap for this week of the cryptocurrency market, $122 billion. Yes, folks, $122 billion. Last week on our show, when we were speaking about the market cap, the market cap was just $104 billion. We're up at $122 billion. It's been a record week on the, on the cryptocurrency market, and I think that this is only the beginning. What makes this crypto market so exciting is the underlying technology that powers this whole market. This technology is known as the blockchain technology, and it's been cited by some to be a bigger revolution than the internet. Joining me in studio is Fazam Asani, who's the head of blockchain for RMB. Fazam, what is this blockchain technology? What makes it so special? So it's a really revolutionary technology. You know, what the internet has done has been, has allowed us to transfer information from person to person across the globe instantaneously. We've never been able to do that with value itself. So when you think about dollars, rands, gold coins, etc. So what this allows us to do is to transfer value instantaneously without relying on a trusted intermediary for the first time in human history. But take a step back. What is blockchain? How does the blockchain work? Sure. So to think about it, I think let's let's think about what it's not. Okay. And what it is not is we need to understand our current system. Our current system currently has several centralized institutions around the world. Oftentimes we call them banks or fintech companies, etc., that are, that really have a centralized ledger where they keep account of how much money you have with them. But really, whenever we transfer money between these different institutions, these different institutions need to be in or collaborate such that when money, the ledger goes down on one of them, it goes up on the other. Now, this system is a unique shared ledger across the entire world. So you eliminate the bank and you replace it with this shared ledger, with, which runs off multiple computers around the world. Well, so if you, if you think about these computers all around the world, or what you'll hear to refer to as nodes, they really have uh, different technologies that are baked into them, cryptography, computer science, economics, incentives, such that they are, are, they're all in sync all around the world. Now, the, the technical details get very, very complex, but what's re really important to note is that w on a voluntary basis, these different nodes can come in and out of the system, and it doesn't break the system or anything like that. And so the system itself stays in sync. So for, for in layman's terms, what these computers all are are contributors into this, this ecosystem, which is now no longer centralized. Is that right? Absolutely. If you think about the internet again, there is no CEO of the internet. There's no one that owns the internet. The internet is a network of different uh, you know, collaborators that come together to transfer information. In like manner, the blockchain is a network of collaborators that come together to transfer value, whether that's Bitcoin, Ether, and there are thousands of cryptocurrencies today. So the most basic application or the original application of the blockchain is that of Bitcoin? Correct. So and that replaces a currency, yeah? Correct. So that was the original manifestation of a blockchain, and that's what really what gave birth to all these cryptocurrencies around the world. And what's so special about this is this individual, Satoshi Nakamoto, or people, we don't know who it was, it's a pseudonym, that individual actually right now, what they've given to the world 
is, is separate from who they are. So it's really now a system, it's a protocol, it's a standard that people can contribute to or leave at the same time and throughout the system maintains itself. So what's the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum, or the Bitcoin blockchain and the Ethereum blockchain? Great question. So Bitcoin was the first uh, manifestation of blockchain as we discussed. And what it is, it's really a token. It's a token that gets transferred, a token of value that gets transferred. There are about 16.5 million in the world right now. There will be 21 million. But really, if you think about a token that gets transferred, while that's wonderful, what Ethereum has done is introduce something called the smart contract. And how does a smart contract work? Sure, if you think about what a contract is, a contract is really obligations between different people. And the way we do it in the world today is we have lawyers and contracts where we actually state what our obligations are. If there's a breach of that contract, then we need to go to a, a court of law. With the Ethereum blockchain, what we can actually do is to take that notation in the contract, put it into code such that when certain conditions are met, those contracts get automatically executed. So give me a simple example of, of a contract that would be programmed or a smart contract that would be programmed into the Ethereum blockchain. So let me give you an example of like insurance, for example. Right now, if you have an insurance policy and you want to actually claim on that policy, you need to write to the insurer, state your case, etc. And hopefully if they agree with you, then they will pay out. With, with Ethereum, if you wanted to say insure yourself against the temperature rising above 40 degrees Celsius. As an example, let's say you had a farm. What you could do is have what's called an oracle, which is a, uh, basically a data feed that both parties trust that submits the, the feed and the information of what the temperature is. What you could say is you could have some value in that smart contract, and whenever the temperature feed goes above 40 degrees, regardless of what we both want to do, that smart contract will release those funds into an account that we have both agreed on previously. So it's like a contract that executes on itself yes. on a trigger of a live data source, so to speak. Correct. That we both agree on. Correct. And there are infinite amounts of kind of ideas and contracts that one can put into play. This is just one example. Give me some more examples. Give me some more examples. And then let's talk about the industries that should be most scared of these examples. Sure. So I think if you think about anything that the legal industry currently does, that where, where you actually need different parties to come together to agree. Um, I think it would be important to think about, uh, I mean, we've talked about insurance, we, we can talk about payments, we can talk about interest rates. Property, does about, property get affected? Property could be. What, what you would need in the first place is to actually get properties registered onto a blockchain. Without registered properties on a blockchain, it would be difficult to do. But once you get assets onto a blockchain, you can tie them up for certain periods of time. You can release them based on different conditions. So there's a lot that one could do with this technology. So we've seen the rise of many startup companies um, all building into the Ethereum blockchain, building their own applications. Are right. you watching any of these startups? There are lots of people that are doing very interesting things. A couple of them are Augur and Gnosis, for example. There's this idea of prediction markets that has come about, which is to say, if people believe that something is going to be happening, and they can wager uh, or put a token on the, on the table to say, I believe this is going to happen. There are certain incentives that start created. So if you have some private information about something that's going to happen, then you're incentivized to bring that private information into the public so that you can actually wager on a particular outcome and it creates more transparency in the world. This is one example of, of something that's also being done. So uh, the endless, there are endless examples on the Ethereum blockchain or endless developments that could be developed on the Ethereum blockchain. Absolutely. Lastly, yes. are you a Bitcoin man or are you an Ethereum man? I'm a Bitcoin and Ethereum agnostic man. I, I think this asset class overall of cryptocurrencies and crypto assets, and as I said, there are tons of them, are something that are absolutely beautiful and that will change the world in quite significant ways. So because I love I mean, Bitcoin, I love Ethereum, but I love others as well. In a world where word of mouth has gone digital, you need Brandseye, the world's first human-verified media intelligence company. First, 
Our powerful algorithm tracks millions of conversations in real time. Next, our global brand's eye crowd scans the data to verify sarcasm, slang, and local languages. We turn this into detailed insights to help you make informed business decisions. Isn't it time you found out what your customers really think? Brand's eye. Accurate insights. Better decisions. A naturally aspirated 5-litre V8 engine. A 10-speed direct shift transmission. A meticulously crafted interior. All of these are feats of engineering. Combining them with a near-perfect weight distribution is a feat of amazing. Experience the first ever 351 kilowatt Lexus LC500. Experience amazing. The prestigious annual CNBC Africa Corporate Golf Challenge returns in 2017 to bring public and private sector together for a good cause. The CNBC Africa Corporate Golf Challenge, in partnership with the ABN Education Trust, will raise funds to support and educate previously disadvantaged youth across Africa. Be part of Building Africa One Child at a Time. Be part of Something Great. Be part of the CNBC Africa Corporate Golf Challenge. All the way from New York City, we have Brian Kelly today on our show. Brian Kelly is from Brian Kelly Capital, and he's a digital hedge fund manager. Brian, welcome to our show. A record week on the markets with Bitcoin hitting a new high. What do you make of this Bitcoin rally? What's causing it? Uh, a lot of uncertainty has been lifted in the Bitcoin market. For the last two years, we've been looking for it in software upgrades so that the network could function better. Uh, and it, it looks like we have that software update coming. Uh, and so that has really lifted a lot of the uncertainty out there uh, in Bitcoin world. What is a software upgrade? What do we need it for? I mean, essentially what's happened is, is uh, uh, the, the Bitcoin network has been used so much, it's congested. Um, it's not any different than your laptop computer where you need more memory on it. You've stored so many pictures on it that now you need more memory. So very similar thing going on on the Bitcoin network. It's being used so much, we need more memory. And then this upgrade, what it allows you to do is actually do a lot more things with Bitcoin beyond just using it as currency. So this is what they call SegWit, right? That's correct. It's called SegWit. Probably doesn't make a lot of sense to the layman, but what you need to know about it is that the memory was upgraded effectively. Bitcoin Cash, a rather disappointing week for these guys, yeah? I actually think it's fairly interesting. It did have a disappointing week, primarily because everybody who owned Bitcoin got Bitcoin Cash for free. So it was like getting free money. At one point, one point it was almost like getting a 14% special dividend uh, for free. So I think a lot of people just said, you know what, I got free money, let me sell it. The price was high, as high, I believe, as 1305, and it's dropped uh, as low as $200, I think, in the last week or so. Uh, it is starting to rebound. Um, so in general, I actually think there could be a decent use case. The way I'm starting to look at it, and I don't know if this is the right way yet, but I look at Bitcoin as the settlement layer, as almost your base money when you're talking about money supply. And then I look at Bitcoin Cash as something like uh, like an M1 or a, a kind of currency that you use more often. So settlement is Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash is your transactional piece. Who are these people that are behind Bitcoin Cash? I heard it's a bunch of miners that are behind this Bitcoin Cash. Who are they? Well, the miners certainly, the miners are the ones who have the most control over the network because they have to agree uh, to any software upgrade. They have to agree to run that software. In this case, you know, two of the prominent figures, actually three of the prominent figures you had uh, were one of the Chinese miners. Uh, you had Roger Ver, uh, who is uh, referred to as Bitcoin Jesus. He's kind of gone around the world and has been an evangelist for Bitcoin. Uh, and he owns an awful lot of Bitcoin. And now he owns an awful lot of Bitcoin cash. Uh, and then the other person behind this or, or supporting it now uh, is John McAfee, which you may remember from McAfee com com 
computers. He's somewhat of an eccentric billionaire is probably what I would call him. Uh, and he's behind Bitcoin Cash as well. So, you know, my view on this is they probably got something up their sleeves. I don't think they're going to let this die. So for me, you know, Bitcoin Cash, I'm rather bullish on. Brian, what about the rest of the market? We've seen this amazing run in the, in the Bitcoin price. The rest of the market being a little bit slower to follow. Can we expect a run in the rest of the market? Yeah, typically it does. Typically the alt current coins or the alternative currencies from Bitcoin will follow Bitcoin's run once it kind of settled down, down a bit. So it's really Bitcoin's world right now. All the news has been surrounding Bitcoin with the software upgrade with Bitcoin Cash. Um, and so, you know, once that settles down, typically if it goes sideways for a bit, then people start to take the profits that they've made in Bitcoin and recycle them into some altcoins. And, and you'll see the rest of the ecosystem start to move up at that point. In other news in Silicon Valley, there's a lot of hype about this coin called Filecoin. What is Filecoin? What exactly do these guys do? So File coin is what they're calling distributed storage. So think about um, your Google Drive or your Amazon Web Services. They're basically going to do that without the servers. They're going to split it up, encrypt it, and put it on everybody's computer in the whole world. And their, their idea by doing that is one, you gain an awful lot of privacy. Uh, and number two, they believe that they can do it cheaper than some of the bigger companies out there. Um, so fa fascinating, fascinating technology. Uh, you know, but you do have to separate the technology from the actual investment process. And, and from where I sit, I think, you know, Filecoin, it could raise billions of dollars, uh, which is a little rich for me. And how much money are they trying to raise? I believe it's uncapped in terms of U.S. dollar amount. I've seen estimates as much as $2 billion. Uh, it's probably going to be in the couple hundred million dollar range, I would guess. So they raised $52 million before the ICO, and now they're raising more money, and they're talking about raising $2 billion. If they get the $2 billion, what are they going to do with it? <laughs> well, that's, that, that's a real good question, because the point is, you know, not only do you have to be phenomenal and experts at the technology, but now you have to be an expert at running a $2 billion corporation which is a special skill set. It isn't always the same type of skill set that makes you good at technology. So you're talking about a real company of $2 billion of cash. They're going to have to hire a lot of people. They will likely hire some kind of CEO figure, uh, maybe somebody with a prominence, uh, or at least who has some operational experience, not that the Filecoin team doesn't, uh, but you're, you're talking about a big organization at that point in time. Brian, any other ICOs that you're keeping your eyes open for? Uh, so for, for this week, I am looking at some of those uh, altcoins. There's a couple that have uh, caught my eye. The one in particular that I like that I'm an investor in is MetalPay. Uh, MTL is the symbol. And they, uh, they are a, a payment solution for the cannabis industry here in the U.S. Um, some of you may know that in the, in the U.S., it's, it's difficult for cannabis reseller, cannabis sellers to get a bank account. And so MetalPay has a solution for that. Uh, I believe they're going to be releasing their alpha product uh, this week. So for me, that's really exciting. Uh, something I've been in. Uh, I was actually an equity investor in the Rain Angel round. Uh, so to see it come to fruition almost a year later is really exciting. Dubbed by Twitter as the Bitcoin Oracle, our next guest is probably better known for his role in the South African version of Shark Tank. Vinny Lingham is a Bitcoin Oracle and is the founder and CEO of Civic. Civic is a company that uses, that creates identity management using the blockchain. Civic recently raised $33 million in an ICO which took just three days. And today I had a peek at the numbers and Civic is trading 100% up at 36 cents. Vinny, the Bitcoin Oracle, do you think that title is justified? Hey Ron, well I never gave myself that title, it just happened to fall on my lap because I made a whole bunch of predictions year after year that have come true uh, around the Bitcoin price. So. It's just been one of those things, I, I suppose. I'll take it. But I haven't always been right, so sometimes I'm wrong. And uh, But I, what I try and do is I try and give reasons and justifications for why I think the movements are going to go whichever way they go. Okay, enough about Bitcoin. Let's talk about Civic. What does Civic actually do? Civic is basically a digital marketplace for identity information. So in South Africa, for example, you have Fika and Rika. And that's a very cumbersome process, which forces consumers to bring in um, identity documents and utility bills and some most of the time the stuff can be forged I mean pretty easily it's paper and so what we're doing is we're creating a digital marketplace where you store your information other companies attest to your utility bill your personal information and when you go somewhere to present it there's a digital signature which ensures that it hasn't been modified or changed and that they can reliably 
um, recognize you as the person who is, you know, who, who you claim to be through your digital ID. So Civic doesn't actually see or store the identification. It's stored in a decentralized way, right? In order to build a system that is, that is um, you know, trusted by multiple parties, but also has a, an air of privacy, you, you can't have a centralized authority in the middle. So with Civic is not a central authority. We are effectively a network play, and everything happens peer-to-peer. -peer. So when you go to a company and present your credentials, that company checks the blockchain to ensure that the, the credentials are correct. They don't check with Civic. So we aren't in the middle of every transaction. We aren't monitoring what you're doing or how you're using your ID information. It's just like walking into a bar and showing your, 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 your driver's license and saying, I'm over 18, I'm over 21. The barman checks it. He doesn't really check all the information, doesn't store it, doesn't remember it. But if the, the DMV or the Department of Transportation was checking every single time you used your driver's license, that would be a huge invasion of privacy. So for the same reason, we don't check when you're using your IDs. We couldn't be the ones in the middle. So we created basically a... a, a, a platform where the blockchain is what is being used to verify that your credentials are correct. Vinny, what I think you're saying is that one day we're going to be able to walk through the airport uh, passport control and show them an app? That's the dream. You raised $33 million in an ICO which took you three days. Why did you do an ICO? Why didn't you just sell equity in your company? Look, we already raised venture capital money for Civic, so we had raised uh, you know, uh, just north of $5 million. And we decided that, um, I mean, look, we could go raise more money, and, and but there is an opportunity in the market to create something a bit bigger than the company. And we wanted to create a, a network-based economy, and that would require tokens. So instead of selling more equity, we decided to create a token economy and sell one-third of the tokens to finance that, give away one-third third to partners to join the economy, and then keep one-third for the, ourselves uh, as a company. Vinny, there's a lot of people in our, in our audience that don't know what the network economy is. Can you explain to us, what is this network economy that you mentioned? Well, think about Bitcoin and Ethereum, for example. These are networks which are network economies. They're worth, you know, Bitcoin's $40 billion plus Ethereum's, you know, whatever, 20 or something. And this is not owned by any one person. It's owned by everyone who participates in the network, whether they're mining, they're running smart contracts, whatever they're doing. So network economy is actually a very interesting new way of, of building out digital economies where it's not really a shareholder based um, service. It's, you know, it's an economy of people who have similar interests around using this technology to do different things. And it's an, it's a functioning economy in and of itself. So basically what you're saying is that everyone in the network is incentivized because they all get civic tokens. Some people for storing data, some people for mining data, everybody gets civic tokens. And that's why it's a decentralized network, right? That's correct. How many tokens did you actually issue? We created a billion tokens and we, we sold um, 330 million to the, to the public, basically. And those were sold at 10 cents? At 10 cents, no discounts for anyone. There was, uh, we, had, we had demand 3x what we had in terms of supply. So there was a lot of demand. We, just, we didn't discount it and we basically gave it to people at par value. Vinny, with all this ICO hype that's going on at the moment, your ICO was cited as one of the better ones, one of the ones that was very fair and transparent. Can you give us some pointers as to what made this such a great ICO? Yeah, so one of the things we didn't want is 200 people buying all our tokens. I mean, the whole point of having a network economy is you have 10,000 people buying tokens, right? And so we had to put limits in place. We had people asking us for $3 million, $4 million in tokens, and we just said, no, sorry, it's going to be um, a cap of $500,000. And we capped the pre-sale at $500,000 with a minimum of 50000 And we had about 400 people participating in that. And then we opened up um, the crowd sale with one third of the offering of 33, so $11 million. And this made it a maximum of 25K for people wanting to participate in the, in the crowd sale. And so we wound up having thousands of people buy in. We had 50,000 people in line on the day trying to buy tokens from us. And it was great because these are all people who want to participate in the network and add value to the network. And what it's resulted in is more business development leads and opportunities that we can actually deal with as a company because everyone's trying to add value to the network and help us grow. So now you've issued these tokens, they're out in circulation, they're trading at an absolute premium. When does your actual product launch? Well, the, the basic product's live right now, so you can download it from the App Store, um, the Civic app, and that creates an identity which you can use on websites like Token Market or Bank of the Future. Um, the usage for the tokens should come into play later this year, where you'll be able to pay for age verification as a, as a website to get. So we're launching that in October. 
So if someone wants to verify that you're over 18 or over 21 to view a particular site, they can have um, the tokens and they can effectively pay for ID verification, age verification. And there's other things you can verify as well. Are you a US person? Are you a uh, foreign national, etc.? Vinny, I know you don't like talking about this, but I know you're in the mix of things in Silicon Valley. Are there any ICOs that you're looking out for today? I don't often talk about other ICOs or token sales I'm involved in, but the one I will mention is Filecoin. Um, you know, it's really been an excellent, well-run uh, project. I was one of the first five investors over three years ago in the company, IPFS, uh, with Protocol Labs. And I think this is one to watch um, for the future. Vinny, I know you're on holiday. I know you're in Hawaii. I can't thank you enough for coming on our show. After last week's show, so many of you have asked me, how can we buy Bitcoin? How can we buy Ethereum in South Africa? Guys, the answer is so simple. You need to go to an exchange, you need to put money in an exchange, and you need to buy Bitcoin. It's really very simple. So let's have a demo. We're gonna go to Luno.com, which is a South African wallet or a, a, an exchange based in South Africa. We're going to click on the tab that says deposit money, and we're gonna deposit money or rands into our account. Now what you can see is it's asked me to choose my bank, you'll choose your bank and you'll choose the amount and you'll deposit money into the account. Now, as you can see, earlier today, I put 65,000 Rand or so into the account so we could learn how to buy Bitcoin. So you can see that the account balance on my account is 63,931 South African Rand. Now, what I wanna do is I wanna take those Rands and I wanna use those Rands to buy Bitcoin. So I click on the exchange button and now I'm on the exchange where I can see all the buyers and I can see all the sellers. And I can see that the buyers are willing to buy at 49,190 and the sellers are willing to sell at 49,191 Rand. So I'm gonna place my order and I'm gonna buy some Bitcoin. I'm gonna buy one Bitcoin and I'm willing to pay 49,195. and I hit the place order button and I confirm my order and bang, there we go. I own the Bitcoin. So we bought the Bitcoin and now we're giving some of this Bitcoin away to some lucky viewers. You wanna win 10,000 Rand worth of Bitcoin? Well, it's so simple. All you need to do is go to our Twitter, at CryptoManRun and retweet our tweet. Or you can open an account on Luno and put in the promo code CryptoTrader. And next week, we'll give away 10,000 Rand worth of Bitcoin to some lucky viewers. So go out there and retweet our tweet about the competition. It's so simple to win your share of 10,000 Rand worth of Bitcoin from Luno and CryptoTrader. All you need to do is go to Luno.com and enter CryptoTrader into the promo code. And you could walk away with your share of 10,000 Rand worth of Bitcoin. Good luck.